Uh, I am excited to be here, and, and that clock is moving so fast. I have so much material that I'm going to try to cover, and um, just welcome you to join me, okay, when we do that. Um, I am, uh, he said I can speak briefly. I'll talk quickly about who I am. Uh, I was not the president, vice president of the Moody Bible Institute. Let's clarify that, right? Served there for a number of years. Uh, a number of our children went there. All of our children ended up somehow in Bible colleges. I don't know what that was about, but we have five wonderful children. Zelda and I, uh, she is the wife of my youth. I met her when I was 15 and she was 13. Uh, we're in our 45th year of knowing each other and hitting 38 of being married. So God has blessed me tremendously. Uh, we have five beautiful ch grown children, um, which uh, the two eldest are here today, Angela and Zanetta. And Zanetta is on the precipice of getting married to a lovely Jim in the back named David. So we're excited about that. So uh, I, I, and thank you for this invitation. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Russ Levinson for this wonderful opportunity of uh, just allowing us to share. So if you would join me right quick, um, let's have another word of prayer. You can never have too much prayer and we'll get started. All right. Let's pray. Father, it is because of you that we live, move, and have our being. We thank you for this opportunity. May your word permeate in our hearts that we may glorify your name. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It has the privilege of serving at the College of Biblical Studies. The College of Biblical Studies' mission is very simple. It is to glorify God by educating and equipping multi-ethnic Christian leaders to impact the world for Christ. That's who we are. Uh, we have several locations. We're in Houston, where our main office is at. We're fully accredited for your college. Also uh, in Indianapolis, right in the Pyramids, um, and in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And we have a whole host of people serving online and getting people educated to really just transform the world. And that's who we are. Uh, I would love, if you get a chance, I would love to uh, have you go back and go to our website. It, as as uh, Dr. Levinson said, we have courses of every single type of thing you can think of about the Bible there. So I encourage you to go on our website and take a look at that. We've just introduced a new program um, called Grace Relations. It's hitting the heart of what divides us. You hear me talk about that today in the church and what God is calling us to, uh, to actually be graceful in our relationship to others. So uh, we ask you to take advantage of that. Uh, here's a question I want to ask. I'll start off by asking a tough question. This is a really tough question, and I want you to ponder it. If the gospel is the answer, why is the church so segregated? As we ponder that, that's a, that's a powerful statement uh, because it is at the fabric, I believe, personally at the fabric of what cripples us from exemplifying what God has called us to be. Not to do, but to be his body. So as we think that through, let that permeate throughout uh, our conversation today. And what I would like to do is ask you another question. The question is, is God's church united or divided? And what we're going to do is we're going to go through three chapters, if you will, three, three segments of this chapters from chapter 2, 11, all the way to 3, 11, very warp speed. But first chapter is going to be understanding the divide. And we're going to examine the key issues through the lenses of scriptures. It's going to be a basis through the lenses of scriptures. But then fasten your seatbelts because I want us to be aware of grasping the frank awareness of the spiritual reality of what has set the church here in the U.S. apart and what has separated us, what has divided us. It's the hard truth, and sometimes that's hard to digest, but it's the history. We can't ignore it. And then thirdly, what I want to do is I want us to consider the biblical aspects in, in a good way, uh, the mandates to engage in the truth of God's word and know how it transforms our lives. So as we begin, come with me and let's go on the journey of looking, what, looking at what God said, word says. Understanding the church divide. And here's where I want to pour in and, and, and quickly just go over some things, because I think here, uh, notice that we're, we're keying on Ephesians. That's where we're at, chapter 2 and 3. We're, we're zeroing in on those chapters. And I want to highlight a few things, because I think here, as we talk about united, understanding the church divide, we have to look at the biblical context. Uh, and the biblical context is very clear. We'll zip through that, but we're focusing in on examining the key issues in Scripture. So keep that in mind in this first chapter as we go through it. So where do we begin? 
I'm a firm believer, and I know that you guys have covered the whole aspect of Ephesus and how it came about. I won't tell you about the church because I know you, you, we're on this series going through there. But I want to highlight one specific verse in chapter one that sets the stage for all of us. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which lavished, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom, insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as the plan for the fullness of time. Keywords to unite, not some, not partial, all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So as we start this, Christ's mission for coming was to unite all things in him. And how do we look at this? We fast forward now to when we get to chapter 2, verse 11. Paul, he, he highlights this. He says, therefore, remember the formal, the, that you formerly were Gentiles in the flesh, called uncircumcision, and it's the so-called uncircumcision by the circumcision, which is formed in the flesh by human hands. Now, pa pause. As a prof, as a president, I can't zip past the therefore. <laughs> Just can't do it, right? We've been teaching our students, you got to figure out what the therefore is therefore. And so it catapults you all the way back to chapter 2 at the beginning of that verse. And we have to look at what Paul was saying. And here I fundamentally believe that here we'll see the biblical, through biblical key issues and scriptures of why these things have eroded the church. What I call them is five pathologies that he's catapulting back to. Five pathologies that erode church unity. And what are they? Number one, misinterpretation of our sin slash evil. Number two, overestimation of our humanity. Number three, underestimation of God's love for us. And number four, secularization of our position in Christ. And number five, eradication of biblical application. Now, I would love to say I have all time to go through this, but this is not the, the, the assignment that I had, so I'm going to briefly give you the context so we can it, it'll catapult us into getting to understand uh, 2.11 all the way through 21. Paul makes this statement, and, and I want to highlight this because he gives the answer, the antidote for the misconception of what's eroding the unity. Number one, misinterpretation of our sin. Have you ever noticed that sin is always out there? Sin, sin is never, can't never be in here. Sin is the person next door. Sin is the stuff that's happening on the other side of town. Sin is always out there. And the enemy could never be in the me. No, just doesn't happen. And through this process, I would say that most average person says, when they look in the mirror, I'm a good person. I'm okay. But then the overestimation of our humanity. And this is where things get a little dicey because I argue that when the essence of our identity is defined by our carnal affiliations, or our purpose is wrapped up in what we do to succeed in this world, we've overestimated who we are. We're doing things on our own volition. And so therefore, as I think about what I am and what I'm doing, they have to coincide together. And so I have to be very careful not to overestimate who I am. Here's a story. I went to a seminary on University of Chicago's campus, and it was like, whew, man, crazy stuff, right? Um, and I went through this process, but I learned Hebrew, and I was loving the language so much that I fell in love with it. I took 18 credits, did nothing but Hebrew. And I went to a large church in Chicago, a very large church, not as big as St. Martin, but somewhere for us, somewhere in the vicinity. But this is an old historic church that was incorporated before the city of Chicago was incorporated. And going there, I had the privilege of teaching this large Sunday school class similar to this one, and I was just getting out of seminary. And so I wanted to show everybody how much I knew about Hebrew. <laughs> and what did I do? I took a passage, and the pastor had assigned me at that point Job. I'm like, oh, this is great. 
So I go on the board and everybody's just watching me. I started writing from right to left and I start going, each hayab, and I'm writing and, and everybody's marveling over this language that they could not even comprehend. Standing ovation. When everybody walked out, one by one, amazed, this little lady had to be at the time probably 88 years young, comes up to me in her frail way and says, Reverend Blocker, I know you spent a lot of money getting that education and learning all that Hebrew stuff, and that's good. But son, I just came to hear about Jesus Christ. And I came in with a head like this, and it shrunk. I realized that my abilities, God doesn't need any of that. Often our estimation of who we are, we think we are God's answer to the world. No, that was Christ's job. And we have to be careful because sometimes when we, we look at things, we have a, a tendency to look at things from our lenses and look at people in other senses of the word down and diminish them because we have our own ability. What we have is privilege. What we have is access. God has given us everything. We know that. And we have to realize it's only to God that it belongs. Let me move forward. So Paul's rebuttal to that is that he says, here, let me show you. Let me, let me just tell you. Allow me to, to, to reiterate, reiterate who you are. He said, I want to take you back down memory's lane. He said, you were dead. <laughs> you were dead in your sins uh, and your trespasses. And he said, you walked according to the power of the air. You lived in the desires of the, of the flesh and the mind. And, and what he's saying here, you had the wrong motivation. You had wrong worldly values. And the bottom line is you were operating on the satanic power because you were trying to do what the enemy wanted you to do. And he goes on and says, you know what? But God. <laughs> but God ransomed us. He redeemed us. And he placed us in this position where we can understand who he is. Let me fast forward. Then he goes, and here's my third one, underestimation of God's love for us, right? Sometimes we don't realize uh, how, and you hear me say this phrase, because I love this Greek, this Greek phrase, basically, an aspect of when Paul says, I want you to understand God's love for us, right? Really, understanding God's love is amazing. The depth of it we can never, ever exhaust. But most people don't realize that God has put us in a favored position. He loves us so much. And I'll talk about that when we get to the second part of it. But secularization of, 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 of our position in Christ, uh, he, he responds to this. says, hey, remember, you know, who you are. God has positioned you. You don't have to do anything. It's not my title. It's not, it's not what my accomplishments are. It's solely based on the fundamental basis that God has adopted me. He has placed me in a position that I cannot rightfully deserve. Now, that's background. And then the last part is eradication of, of biblical application. I won't get into details of that, but the bottom line here is, uh, he says that we are created in Christ Jesus to, to do what? Unto good works. And, and I'm gonna close on that one, circle back, because this is a powerful passage in and of itself, but we're designed to, to shine our lights so the world can see and know that he's God, all right? That's all background. So let's get into let's get into the actual text, right? Here's what I'll say: lack of lack of biblical application leads to, to to division. This is what I argue: we don't reproduce what we desire; we reproduce who we are. Let that sink in. And you can ask the millennials; they'll give you a great, a good understanding of what we're reproducing. They'll tell you in a minute, right? I'm a byproduct of you, but. And this is a quick chart, and, and I won't go into details with this. I take our uh, then our discipleship process, everybody through this chart. But here's the premise I want to make here. When we understand Christ's calling. If you look at what's missing, the outcome of that is humanism and secularism. If we don't understand uh, the biblical perspective of what God is doing, how we should look through eternal perspective through his lens, when that's missing, we end up with carnal carnality and materialism. We look at any other lenses in, 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 in the context of scriptures, if we don't approach it from a servant's perspective, if we don't come as Christ did with a basin and towel in our hands, and have the servant perspective, then we end up with narcissism and elitism. 
If we're missing how to look at Christ and model what he did and how he did it, we'll walk away with legalism and pharisaicism. If we're missing the aspect of walking obedience and applying the word, we become hypocrites. And so this is just a quick chart to give you an idea of of what Paul is trying to get, get these people in the context of Ephesus to see. And he reminds them, we're dead in our sins, trespasses and sins. We walked according to the worldly values. We lived according to the prince of the air. We indulged in all those fleshly desires and we were made alive by Christ. Thank God we were made alive by Christ. And he goes on and gives attention about this world of flesh and, 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 and how the enemy plays that, that, that threesome together. And if we're not careful, if we don't fully understand the nature and how they work, we fully won't grasp the radical redemption that was necessary to snatch us out of the hands of the enemy. Now, having said that, he says, therefore, right? Here's a passage. Therefore, therefore, you were once separated from Christ. Now, he's talking to the nation of Israel, right? And the, the Gentiles who, who, who've been alienated in the past scriptures, they hadn't had access to the temple. They were cast aside, basically excluded from the citizenship of, of Israel, living according to the prince of the air, without hope, no God. Think about that for a second. Can you imagine alienation from God? We were once there. Have been brought near because of Christ, both Jews and Gentiles. Quick picture I want to just highlight. This is just Herod's temple. Zelda and I, we take Israel trips every year. If you ever want to go to Israel, we, we take trips every year, and we, we just love Israel. And, and here, this is a replication of Herod's temple, but if you can saw, see in, in my right, which is your left, um, that, that context of what is called a Gentile's courtyard. Far off, alienated cut out, could not come in even. This is who he's talking to. He's saying, you guys were, and not just physically, but spiritually, they were alienated. And how does he handle all of that? He says, now God has brought you near. And so what is he he really saying? He's saying, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget that you weren't always in this position. It's only because Christ and his redemptive work that he has pulled you in. He has allowed through his grace to pull you in to be adopted into this family. And he gets to the point of saying, okay, now, since you're in the family, what are you going to do? If you ever want to know an easier way to remember, easiest way to remember all of Ephesians, I'll give you a two-minute synopsis of all of Ephesians, right? Very two-minute, two-minute, high level, right? Ephesians could be broken down in this. First three chapters is doctrine. Second three chapters is duty. You can say the first three chapters are basically the wealth of the scriptures. And the last three, he wants us to be the witness in the context of the scriptures. I don't know why that's coming up there, but we'll keep going. Um, the, the aspects of um, how do we get to the point where understanding the first three chapters, if the first three chapters is predicated upon the word of God and how God has laid out the lessons for us to learn, then the last two chapters, four, five, and six, is how we should live out those chapters. An easy way to remember uh, the context of, of Ephesians. So, uh, therefore, we drill into the question now. If God has torn down the wall of separation and made the two groups into one, why can't we unite as one? Paul prays, and we'll talk about the prayers at the end, but he prays these prayers, and, and now i got, I got to dig in because the clock is moving. But here, here's Billy Graham said. Here's a hard fact. Brace yourselves. Racism in the world and in the church is one of the greatest barriers to world evangelism. This is him back when he was evangelizing. Tough aspect. Dr. Tony Evans says, it is my contention that the fundamental cause of the racial problems in America is, is lies squarely in the church's failure to become to come to the grips of the issue from a biblical perspective. Church divided. We have 256 flavors of denominations. Flavors of denominations. God has one church. 256. Think about that for a second. 
You can get them in two colors, black or white, most of them. Why? N.T. Wright says race is a bi biological concept and it is a, a fiction that empowers whites to imp at the expense of people of color. This is N.T. Wright making a statement. Frank awareness of the spiritual reality. John Piper, race isn't just a social issue, it is a blood issue that undermines and rejects the work of the Christ on the cross. So how do we grasp this frank awareness? I put in my notes it was going to get very quiet when I got to this point. <laughs> Grasping the frank awareness. We saw the spiritual keys, it starts as a spiritual phenomenon. Now, how do we grasp the frank awareness of the spiritual reality that divides the church here in our country? Got to go back. Got to go back. Let's revisit it. Won't take long. Let's go back and revisit it. Here we go. Number one, Billy Graham again, quoting the same verse that I'm, I'm going to be preaching and teaching from. I do not pretend to know the full answer. But here's a key point. Let those who claim the name of Christ report all our past failures. And he goes on to say, I'm relying on the Holy Spirit to demonstrate uh, to a weary and frightened world that Christ indeed has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So what were the past failures? In the U.S., it's about this divide. Here's a chart, and I won't go into great details with this, but it is, I, this is a chart I put together giving a summary, keyword, history summary of time of racism and the divided church. And I want to just highlight a few things here because I think it's necessary just to, just to highlight some points. It starts um, from this whole angle of what I call tethering Christianity, dealing with the socioeconomic aspects of slavery and comes all the way up through. Problem number one. Here, here is problem number one. And this is a frank awareness, so keep that seatbelt fast and tight. There were rebellious slaves and the church was supposed to be the answer. And so they went to the clergy and says, what do we do? And what was the natural cl clergy response in the early 1700s? Give them Christ Jesus. And they did. And boy, did they give them Christ Jesus. But now there's another problem that comes up. And that problem is... Spiritual freedom versus temporal bondage. So now I read in the scriptures that I am made free. What does that mean? So now there's a second problem that is created. The second problem is this threatening of rioting because if I'm free, why can I be free? And an institutional solution has to be going back to the clergy. Clergy, how do you handle this? What should we do? And here's what they did. They came up with a threefold solution. Legislation, the letter, and the law. Let's create legislation on baptism, what it means. Let us create, get letters to validate our understanding of what freedom means. And then let's Make it a law. Well, in 1729, I call it the evangelism dilemma and the clergy compromise. Bottom line is, they came to the conclusion, they defined what baptism really means, they came in and got British appeal letters, British general letter, solicitor general letter came in, and they got the clergy, and here's the, here's the, Here's the letter. The letter basically said baptism does not negate slave status. Baptism ensures eternal freedom, but not freedom from temporal bondage. Now, sad reality of that is there is this debate, a question that gets raised up by Thomas Jefferson and Patrick Henry. And here's the question. I'll read it verbatim because I quoted it. 
What is the difference between institutional slavery and American rhetoric of the right to freedom? When sin is fused or concretized in the structures or systems, it creates a false sense of righteousness that sears our rational ability to recognize truth beyond its fear. Here's an example. Inside our own religious systems, we can readily see the sin of immorality. Not a problem spotting it. We can subconsciously dismiss the sin of partiality that James talks about. So, I put it in here, if they're not throwing shoes at you at this point, just keep going. Um, where do we go? Here's how sin gets distorted so much. If you've ever been to Bible Museum, I encourage you, just go there. Bible Museum is a great place to go in, in, in Washington, D.C. It's at their prime position, prime location. Long story short, it gets there, and uh, I had to look this up because I wanted to see it. The truth was distorted. Do you realize that the scriptures that were handed out to those who were marginalized, they yanked out some of the parts of the scripture. They tore out the Moses narratives. They talked about Pharaoh and how he and captivated the, the, the Egyptians, captivated the, the Israelites, but they snatched out when Moses led them out of Pharaoh's hand. They ripped out the pages that dealt with the, the reality of them being freed. And then they went to the New Testament and they yanked out in this very same Bible that's on display. They yanked out anything to do with Paul's letters that talked about there's neither bond nor free. Right? They, they, they yanked out anything to do with what Christ was talking about, about freedom. Those who are set free are free. Now that I've, I've, I've taken you to the precipice of your despair here, I want to just skip through this right quick and talk about all is not lost. Here's some denominational acknowledgments that have come about since all of these things. There's movement taking place, and the church is trying to get back together. That's a great thing. 1995, Assemblies of God, they called it the miracle of Memphis. This is radical. I admit, this is mad radical. Event known as Memf Miracle of Memphis when the white Pentecostal denominations dissolved the ra racially segregated Pentecostal Fellowship of North America and favored a new organization of the Pentecostal and charismatic churches of North America. They wiped out all the positions and then invited everybody to come in and form one church. Now, people can debate whether or not it's still the function the way it should, but the final line is they, they eradicated that wall. Second thing, Southern Baptist 2018. Seminary made this statement. We must acknowledge the legacy of slavery and racism in the history of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, which Moeller had commissioned. Noted, the founding faculty of this school, all four of them were deeply involved in slavery and deeply uh, complicit in the defense of slavery. Many of the successors of this faculty throughout the period of the recon recon uh, Reconstruction and, and well into the 20. I can't go there. The 20th century advocated segregation. The inferiority of the African Americans and openly embraced the ideology of the lost cause of the Southern slavery. What we knew in generalities, we now know in detail. Billy Graham says, be bold to talk about your last failures, your past failures. Let's get to the good news. Considering biblical mandates and how we should unite. unite. Here's where I'll highlight some things. Billy Graham, I love quoting you because I love quoting Billy Graham. Um, no other force exists besides the church that can bring people together week after week and deal with their deepest hurts and suspicions. Of all people, Christians should be the most active in reaching out to those of other races instead of accepting the status quo of division and animosity. John Perkins says this, as I come closer to the end of my journey, I'm aware that community development can only take us so far because this is a gospel issue. 
Paul has two prayers. I'm landing the plane now. Paul has two prayers. The first prayer we find in chapter 1. The second prayer we find in chapter 2. The first prayer is simply, if you want to boil it down and make it very simplistic, he's praying that their eyes may be opened. Why? He says, I want your eyes to be open because I want you to realize what you have in Christ Jesus. That's the first prayer. I want you to realize what God has given you. I want you to realize the resources that you have. I want you to realize how much authority and power God has deposited in you. Know the spiritual power that Christ has. And, and I get, he goes on before that in every spiritual, in every spiritual, uh, spiritual blessings in every, uh, in heavenly places. And then the second prayer is, I want you to know what you have, but then I want you to know what to do with it. Not just know what you have, but know what to do with it. Now, I, I, I'm a, I, I love old, old television shows. I'm, 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 I grew up in that era where I just love them. And when I came to my, I can't, as I older I get now, I start connecting these bubbles, these blips in my head with scripture patches because what comes to mind when I read stuff is I see these comics and these, and these things. So when I read this about know what you have in your resources, you have to know what they are and then you have to know how to use them. The first thought came to mind was Barney Fife, I'm confessing. <laughs> and he knew, he thought he knew how to articulate how to use the power he had of the pistol. He would take it out, and Andy would never allow him to use the, have the bullet in it because he, he would kill himself, right? But he would take the gun, he would open it up, he would describe the 45, and he would spin the chamber around. He says, Andy, I'm, let me show you. I, I know how to work the power of the pistol. And he would wheel it around. And one day, Andy took off, and the prisoners that were locked up in the jails, because the jails that were locked up, he was going around strutting his stuff as Barney normally does, right? You can see the picture, right? And what does he do? He brags so much that he knows that he has the power and the authority that has been invested in him as deputy. Then he lets the guys out. And what do they do? They take his gun <laughs> and they point it to his own head and this picture of him to his head. And he comes back and Andy, Andy's looking like, what happened? His eyes are this big. What Paul is saying to us is that it's not good enough just to know doctrine. It's not good enough to know the aspects of what belief systems God has put into the scriptures unless we know how to live it out. It's all for nothing. He's praying. Know the power. Know what God has given you. Understand what he's given you. I love this because here's a point, and I'll, and I'll start winding down. Here, here's the aspect of how this comes together. He says, once we understand this, we understand what it means. And here's the five principles to activate church unity. You got five minutes to land this. He says, I'm praying that God would strengthen, the spirit would strengthen the inner man. And we'll talk about that. He said, I'm praying that God would allow Christ to dwell in your hearts. That word for, for, for dwell, by the way, katikeho, it literally means not just the indwelling. This is talking about God settling down. He's settling down in, my, in our hearts. A, a great Presbyterian minister by the name of um, Randy Boyd Munger writes this book, My Heart, Christ Home. It's a fabulous book. It talks about how... Our body, what we, our heart is compartmentalized in these various compartments. And he talks about how Christ comes in. He talks about the living room and, 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 and God comes in the living room. He talks about the mind being the library. And when Christ comes in, he comes into our heart. And, and so he goes up to the library. And what does he see? He sees books that don't belong, has nothing to do with him. And he goes into the living room where everybody should be really inviting people in. It looks like it's never been lived in. Christ can't settle down there because why? Because everybody's too busy. And then without stealing the whole thunder of the book, he goes to the stench that's in the hallway. And that hallway stench that he smells is where we have decided to hide all that closet stuff, all those secret sins. 
that Christ can't settle down because he's too busy putting out the fires in our lives. Here, watch this carefully. Look at what he says, though, grounded in his love and that comprehension that it would cut to Lombardo is just, just amazing. But he says, grounded in Christ's love, filled with the fullness of God and in glorifying him. Let me, let me wrap this up. If you notice here, the Holy Spirit, Christ, and the Father are all right wrapped up into this context closely. It's catapults in my mind to John 17, where God is praying to the Father. He says, make them one as we are one. Sometime in eternity past, God had all his love. God is never outside of perfect harmony with his Son, perfect harmony with his Holy Spirit. They've always been in perfect harmony together. But somehow, God decided to let that love spill out in a way that he gave us. A glimpse of that love when he said to the son, here, I'm going to give you a bride. I'm going to give you a grace gift of man that needs to be redeemed. And Christ, in perfect harmony with the Father, says literally in that context, he says, I am going to reciprocate you because you've given me a grace gift of that harmony and love that we have so much together that I am going to give myself up in order that I may redeem them and present them thoughtlessly before you. I am going to take that time and do that in such a way so that we will have a chance to experience them in the way they experience us. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, I got to get a piece of this action. (laughs) If God the Father is going to give you so much as grace gift and son, you're going to offer yourself up for him. What I am going to do I'm going to guarantee it with a promise, the promise of the guarantee until the time of inherited possession. And what we see is that perfect harmony being poured out toward us in a way that Paul says, the spirit needs to strengthen you. Christ needs to settle down and get rid of all those things that are distracting us so that we may be grounded in that love, filled with the fullness that flows over when we have that intimate time with Christ. And so perfect love with the Father, perfect love with the Son, perfect love with His Spirit, then pours out to us. And what happens? Here's the beauty. That love that Christ existed from eternity past now pours into us. And when we are looked at by the world, if we can ever come together, as Christ has already set up everything that we have already in heavenly places, if we can come together, the glory of God, I can't imagine. The love that he's given us will shine so bright so that the world may know that we are his. Now, I told you I was going to go back to 10 because I don't want to end there, but, 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 but here's, here's how Paul crescendos this. We go to verse 10, and verse 10 is a little, is a hidden nugget. I just got to put this here. It's a hidden nugget in verse 10 that is just so absolutely incredible. He says in this, and this is, you, you got to read it carefully because you'll miss it. It says, fellow citizens and saints that we are of God's household having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Watch this. And, and, and here's the beauty of it. It catapults us back to this one simple phrase in verse 16 and 17. And Paul's praying, and he's praying for this inheritance to happen so that God may get the glory. But he says, I want it to happen because when you guys come together on one, the angels in heaven are glorifying God because of what he's doing through you. And Paul burst out with the crescendo. And he ends this whole passage by saying now to him, who is able to do abundantly beyond more than we can even ask or think according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Here's what it looks like. If we can get out of the way 
allow God to surrender to him and tear down those strongholds of our imagination and let him rule in our lives and connect. The world will see something that they've never seen before. They will see the power of God, the power that resides in him. And what is the outcome? Not unto us, but unto the Lord. Can you imagine, here's my prayer, and I'll share it with you as I close. Here's my prayer in short. Can you imagine? Wipe away the denominational lines for one minute. Everybody coming together for one reason. Not for stage fronting, not for our own glorious uh, aggrandizement. For one reason only. Soli Deo Gloria. Can you imagine if every single person who has been called to Christ comes for no other reason than a solemn assembly and get together to glorify God? I can't imagine what it would look like. My challenge to you, as Paul says, let the rule of God rest in your heart so that he may get the glory in Christ's name. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the fact that you have given your church as the only institution that you have granted unto your son that, Lord, he may present us faultlessly before your presence. Thank you for what we are experiencing through your word. And thank you for your Holy Spirit that will redeem us, who's torn down that barrier between us. Lord, remind us that the barrier is down. We just have to have the boldness, the power you give us to use it to cross over and see your glory. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Blessings.